QSO Today, episode 276, Kate Hutton, K6HTN. This episode of QSO Today is sponsored by ICOM America, makers of the finest HF, VHF, and UHF transceivers and accessories for the radio amateur. It should be noted that ICOM is a proud sponsor of Youngsters on the Air, or Yoda events coming up in December. Check the Yoda link in this week's show notes pages. This episode is also sponsored by QRP Labs, makers of the popular QCX kit transceiver and a whole host of other kit receivers and parts for the home brewer. My thanks to both ICOM America and QRP Labs for sponsoring the QSO Today podcast. Welcome to the QSO Today podcast. I'm Eric Guth for Z1UG, your host. My QSO today is with Kate Hutton, K6HTN, who came to Ham Radio relatively recently after a career as a seismologist at Caltech in Pasadena, California. Kate has discovered CW and CW Ops and passing traffic through the National Traffic System, or NTS. Now retired, Kate would agree that amateur radio is a great way to pass the time, and getting on the air is the best way to be ready for the next natural disaster. K6HTN, this is Eric, 4Z1UG. Are you there, Kate? 4Z1UG, this is K6HTN. Back to you. Kate, thanks for joining me on the QSO Today podcast. Can we start at the beginning of your ham radio story? When and how did it start for you? Well, when I was in junior high school, I was gifted a shortwave receiver by my family, and I had a ball with it. I didn't think it was going to be much fun in the beginning, but uh, it actually turned out to be a, a a useful experience to me because we lived in Taiwan at the time and there were no TV stations and barely a radio station in English in Taiwan at that time. Um, and Voice of America was it, right? And I, I stayed up at night listening to uh, the flights of John Glenn and people like that on Voice of America Live. That was cool. And I scanned the bands and I heard, you know, different types of exchanges and I heard heard code stuff and I wondered what it was and in my mind it was all spies or something like that it was probably ships actually but in my mind it was mysterious okay so yeah I thought okay you know someday I want to learn Morse code but I didn't get around to it so why were you in Taiwan my parents were missionaries and so the gift of a shortwave receiver to a teenage girl would be unusual in America but I guess at that point in your life you're at a far corner of the world that wasn't so unusual yeah, it fit the bill exactly. In those days, Taiwan was um, a third world country. I mean, it has changed in, since then to a major power, but uh, it was sort of backwards in that time. Right. It was also the time of the Cultural Revolution in mainland China, the Cold War in Russia. I'm assuming that was this time period. Yeah. So it would have been a very unusual and interesting place. Is there a lesson that you got from growing up in Taiwan that you probably wouldn't have experienced had you grown up in the United States? Well, I think I've learned to be more open to possibilities that are not necessarily set up for girls, you know, like housework and cooking and stuff. And of course, I had to do that. But I got to see a lot of other things and different types of people um, of different religions. And it was it was a it gives me a broader view. How did your education proceed from there? There, I was in um, American schools uh, because my Chinese was not good enough for that, uh, you know, for being indoctrinated into um, the Chiang Kai-shek era, right, which is what the schools did. But anyway, so I was either in a, the American school that was for business people and uh, military and so forth, or I was in uh, base schools on the American military bases, which were terrible. But anyway, um, after that, I came back to the U.S. to live with my aunt and uncle for a year so I could graduate from a high school in the U.S. and help me get into college. Um, I went to Penn State, and uh, then I went to University of Maryland for graduate school. I was interested in earthquakes and all kinds of phenomena like that, but my major was astronomy. I ended up doing radio astronomy in, at University of Maryland and for a year or so after that. Then the, the possibility was being thrown out of earthquake prediction, and things were starting to move that way, which interested me. And I had friends who were working at JPL who had been using radio astronomy techniques to measure geodesy or um, positions of places on the Earth's surface and were rubbing hands with the people at Caltech through various 
channels, I managed to get myself a job at Caltech. That's where my education went in Caltech. I was mostly in charge of data processing for the Southern California earthquakes. That was my take on it. It was pretty localized to Southern California. Do you have a PhD in astronomy or in seismic science? No, my PhD is in astronomy. In astronomy. But it sounds to me like astronomy meshed really well with the kind of activity that was happening at Caltech. It's my understanding that you were there for, what, 37 years? That's right, 37 years. And what did you do there? One main part of it was, as I mentioned, the data processing for the Southern California earthquakes and going through all the technological changes that involved uh, involved that. Um, and also I did a lot of uh, media relations type stuff. When there was an earthquake, I would get on the TV or uh, they would come out to our, you know, the cam- they bring the cameras out to trucks out to our lab and they would want to talk to some of us. And I was one of the people that got pulled into that. So especially in the early days when I was working there, I was, um, I did a lot of that and became sort of recognizable, which is is sort of strange. You became the earthquake lady, I guess, in the Southern California area. It's two earthquake ladies. Well, now there's really three earthquake ladies now, but I was the first one. How has the prediction of earthquakes changed? I grew up in Southern California and remember the February 9th, 1971 Silmar earthquake. They may have called it something else, but I remember it distinctly. I sometimes have this idea that when earthquakes are measured, it's because there's uh, seismometers that are scattered around the state, and there's actually someone that writes down and says what's happening with it, and it gets sent back by email or entered into a database. But it's my understanding this is also very sophisticated now, that you're actually maybe looking at earthquake action all over the world, not just the ring of fire that extends from one end of California to the other. Well, seismology has always been worldwide, because the large earthquakes especially are easily detectable worldwide with seismometer equipment. But the technology has changed a lot. And, you know, when I started working at Caltech, it was definitely, let's read these paper records or dump off the computer and and measure it with a ruler and figure out, you know, where the quake was and how big it was. And it was quite manual. Nowadays, they just brought out an early warning system in California, which you can subscribe to on your cell phone, and uh, it will give you uh, an indication that a quake has been detected quickly enough that you might actually hear about it before you feel it, because it takes time for the seismic waves to travel. I thought I read someplace that it's possible to leverage the accelerometers in cell phones that people are carrying if they had an earthquake app, so that you could actually crowdsource 100 million people around the world that are walking on the ground and that that might be a way to do earthquake detection. Is there any truth to that? I don't know about the cell phones, but there are uh, units that you can put on your your uh, desktop computer, which is same in one location, uh, and it can, be, it can go into the system for detecting earthquakes. As far as I know, and I could be wrong because I've been retired for several years, uh, the cell phones are involved in receiving the messages from the early one. But they're not being used necessarily as, as earthquake detectors. Well, because they're moving around. You're moving around all the time with the cell phone in your pocket. It's not going to be much help. How did you actually finally come to amateur radio and become licensed? Can I throw in a few, like, pre-Elmers from or before that? Absolutely. My advisor, when I was in grad school, one of my advisors was uh, Tom Clark, K3IO, and he was big in AMSAT. That was his, his – he was an electronics engineer type person and a, an astronomer, and he, um, that was his take on it. He really tried to get all of us to get our licenses, I think. He didn't really come out and say it, but we had readings assigned from the Amateur Radio Handbook to teach us electronics. And radio astronomers need to know something about electronics. So, uh, But somehow I didn't, I didn't take that, fight, that bait, okay? But uh, I did sort of absorb some. And earlier than that, when I was in college, uh, uh, one of my dorm mates was dating a ham. Uh, and his name is John Portelli, and now his call sign is W3PD. I don't know if it was the same in that time. And he managed to save us from a long walk, <laughs> uh, mm-hmm. from a picnic, home from a picnic after the car broke down. He radioed his buddy back in the shack, and 
the guy brought the parts up that were needed to move the car. So this uh, is a pre-cellular days. Yeah, definitely. Yeah, it was in the uh, I would say in the late sixties. I have had some glimpses of him during that time period. Well, you mentioned to me that there was a first California shakeout drill. What year was that? Two thousand eight. It's always in November because it was the first one. We were on camera at in our lab. Uh, when the shakeout earthquake supposedly happened and we had sound effects and you know this whole thing it was a lot of fun and as someone in charge of data processing i had an assignment you know here's your assignment you hand me a piece of paper and it says you have some information about the earthquake before everything failed but there's no phones and no internet what are you going to do Okay, so I'm thinking about this for about 30 seconds, and two students walked in with HTs in their hands, and they said, we are representing the the Caltech Amateur Radio Club. Uh, We can talk to any EOC in Southern California. What do you want to say? An EOC is an emergency operations center. Okay, so I'm like spinning, my head is spinning, and I'm going, okay. And I wrote down, you know, what I thought the information was that we were supposed to have, which was that it was the big earthquake on the San Andreas. They made me write it down, okay, and then they sent it by voice to the shack, uh, to the Caltech Amateur Radio Club shack, and then uh, those guys were on a net, which included all the EOCs in Southern California. When we're talking Southern California, we're talking from Fraser Mountain or from Fraser Pass all the way to San Diego? Yeah, right, exactly. So that's a huge area. It's half the state. So what happened after that? So you, all of a sudden you see that there's a use for amateur radio. Did you actually join the Caltech Amateur Radio Club and try to become active and understand what was going on? Well, that's what I thought. I really needed to get my, my ham license. That was my first thought. I went to, actually went to the Pasadena Radio Club because Caltech Amateur Radio Club doesn't have meetings. They, they have a shack and they get in there and they do their stuff, but they don't have, generally have meetings. But anyway, I went to Pasadena Radio Club. And I uh, said I was going to take my test and blah, blah, blah. And I, I passed a technician and uh, started studying for general. And was when I got my general, I wanted to put in HF at my house. And I realized that I needed to have some help. So I went to Pasadena Radio Club and I said, um, can you give me an Elmer? They put hooked me up with Alan Wolf, KC70. And he uh, helped me put in the uh, antenna and radios, helped me choose radios, antennas, and everything to get on to HF. Unfortunately, the sunspots were really low at that time, <laughs> uh, which might have some influence on why I got involved with NTS, because it's more local. What year did you get your general class license? 2009. That was your first license. You didn't go through technician first. No, the, I got... March 2009 was my technician, and sometime during the summer was my general. What's your class now? Are you an extra class? Extra class. It took me probably another six months or so. Alan helped you put up your first antenna. What was the first rig? Well, my first rig was a Yesu FT897. It's a VHF, UHF, and HF, all mode rig. And I still use it for some things. I use it for um, a digital Pactor and so forth, and I use it for all my VHF and UHF, including CW, as well as voice and repeaters. The rig that I use now mostly for CW is the, my uh, K3, Elecraft K3. Do you have the pan adapter? Uh, yes, I do. It's really weird. I Somehow I think I should be able to hear signals better if I'm staring at the pan adapter. <laughs> well, at least you know where they are with the pan adapter. And I know, you know, if if um, I get if I'm on a net and I get sent to a QSY, then I know, I could see if there's anything there or not, you know. So now you've mentioned that you operate CW. It seems to me that we're kind of in a era now where CW it's not required, it's not necessary. There's a whole bunch of other ham radio activities on the air that are different than CW, and there's a wide variety of them. Why do you operate CW? Well, I don't operate exclusively CW, but I. You know, it's one of my favorites. And maybe it goes back to when I was a child and, you know, dreaming about what those spy signals were on the air. I don't know. But what I did after I, you know, when I was preparing to put up the HF, I bought the um, 
ARRL operating manual, which has a chapter of a lot of different possible activities that you can do, including contests and DX and whatnot. I'm sure you're familiar with this book. Right. That's where I discovered, you know, I think I really want to do CW and I really think I want to do, I want to pass message traffic. Because it, it seemed like, well, a good way to make, to solidify my CW skills for one. Uh, but also it was uh, sort of a structured you know, I don't, don't have to sit here and worry about what to say on the air because it's it's all set out for me. It's, I've got it in my hand. And now this message from ICOM America. Wish it, wrap it, gift it. These are the code words to your XYL or significant other to get the holiday gift of an ICOM transceiver to meet your ham radio goals in the coming year. ICOM offers a variety of high-performance and innovative products, so make the most of the holiday season with one of these ICOMs today. Tis the season to give your favorite ham the SDR they really want, and that's the ICOM IC7610. This high-performance SDR has the ability to pick out the faintest of signals, even in the presence of stronger adjacent signals. The ICOM IC7610 is a direct sampling software-defined radio, or SDR, that will change the world's definition of an SDR transceiver. It is exactly the right rig for DXing, contesting, and rag chewing. Its features include RF direct sampling system, 110 dB RMDR, independent dual receivers allowing you to listen in two places at once, and dual Gigi cell. The ICOM IC7300 has changed the definition of an entry-level HF transceiver. This compact footprint also includes RF direct sampling, 15 discrete bandpass filters, a large 4.3-inch touchscreen, and a real-time spectrum scope or pan adapter. I have the IC7300 in my ham shack and love being able to see the activity in the bands as I'm tuning. Finally, the IC9700 is ICOM's latest entry in the VHF and UHF amateur transceiver market. The IC9700 should be at the top of every ham's wish list this holiday season, especially if EME or moon bounce or meteor scatter operation will be one of your New Year's resolutions. This all-mode transceiver works in the 2-meter, 70-centimeter, and 23-centimeter bands. Keep your competitive contesting edge with the faster processors, higher input gain, higher display resolution, and a cleaner signal. ICOM IC9700 is the pinnacle of perfection. Features include a 4.3-inch touchscreen color TFT LCD display, dual watch operation and full duplex operation in satellite mode, real-time high-spectrum scope and waterfall display, voice recording playback function with an SD memory card, and it has the same form factor as the IC7300 and will look beautiful next to any of your new ICOM rigs. Wish it, wrap it, and gift it are the code words that I opened this message from ICOM. However, if subtle hints or leaving ham magazines open to full-page ICOM ads does not seem to have the desired effect on your XYL, then just tell her that you are pining after a new ICOM rig and that you know where the nearest ICOM dealer is near you, and you will be happy to save her the trouble of wrapping it and gifting it. And when you buy that new ICOM holiday rig, be sure to tell your ICOM dealer that you heard it here on the QSO Today podcast. Fa la 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 la. And now back to our program. You've mentioned already NTS, the National Traffic System. I have to tell you, I don't think I've heard anybody mention NTS except in novice stories 50 years ago. And frankly, I'm kind of surprised that NTS is still even active. All those NTS listeners will tell me, oh, Eric, you don't know what's going on. Well, that may be true. Why are you attracted to NTS? And really, how active is NTS? Is it a daily occurrence? Is it a weekly occurrence? What's happening with NTS? Maybe you can explain what it is first and why it's important. NTS is a, in the national traffic system, and it's a structured set of nets uh, that's designed to be able to move messages from anywhere in the U.S., to anywhere in the U.S., okay? And it, I have to say it's not 100% successful now because not all those nets exist anymore, but some of them do. And for the most part, the long-distance part of it is carried by a different group, which is called the Radio Relay International. NTS in the old days was all CW, I think, but nowadays there's, um, well, there's local nets are on often on repeaters. Those feed and receive messages to region nets which are usually CW, 
and the region nets feed to area nets, and there's three areas in the U.S., the western area net, central area net, and eastern area net. It's sort of like a message travels up the chain and then it goes across and then down the chain if it's going cross-country. People don't use it. I mean, the public doesn't use it. People don't. We don't go to county fairs and solicit radiograms messages to your grandparents somewhere because it's much too easy for you to pick up your cell phone and just call them. Or use WhatsApp or something. Yeah, right. But we do use it to sort of promote ham radio. The bulk of the messages that go right now through NTS are some version of welcome to amateur radio or congratulations on your new license or congratulations for joining fists or, you know, whatever ties the people have uh, that they to organizations that they want to welcome people into. Uh, my thing is New Hams. So I do new I send messages to New Hams in certain parts of the country. Now do you get a list of New Hams? Is there some published place where you actually see who the New Hams are? Yeah, the FCC database. Go through the FCC database, yeah. And it sends updates periodically of lists of New Hams? Yeah. Hey actually. Oh, that's pretty amazing. Okay. Yeah, I have to look up the phone numbers because they don't give phone numbers, which is right. They, they should not give phone numbers. The NTS form, the radiogram format, we keep using that because we train people uh, on how to be accurate. Copy a message exactly the same way that it was sent to them. I noticed that you wrote an article about the NTS form and I can only imagine that if there was no format for message handling, that it could be kind of chaotic in terms of the kind of information that you get. What is the format, and why is it so important to stick to it? Last question first. The, the reason that we stick to it is for the purpose of accurately transcribing messages. So that the one that comes out on the other end of where it's going is the same as the one that I sent. And the message, is, the message has four parts. And the first part is a preamble, which has information on uh, my indexing of the messages, who I am and where I am, and what date and time I've sent it, okay? And how many words there are in the message. That's important because that's a check, accuracy. Second part is the addressee section where it's going, address, phone number, whatnot. And the third part is the message, the actual text of the message, and then the fourth part is the person sending it. When I send a message to a new ham, it's I'm in the preamble and the signature at the bottom, but I could be sending on behalf of somebody else. So then the person's name would be there. Will the message form now, has it been updated to include perhaps an email address? Yes, it will take an email address. Yeah, but we still spell out the word at, A-T, K6-H-T-N, initials alpha tango, Initials Alpha Romeo, Romeo Lima, dot, I spell Delta Oscar Tango, net. I spell any, basically because it could go on CW. Now, we do have digital nets or digital modes also, and we have some voice nets. Okay, so it's not all CW anymore. A lot of the traffic is uh, transferred on automated PAC tool. Does NTS now have either a software or something like that to uh, give you the form so that if you're handling a lot of traffic that you can actually type that information into a pre-organized NTS form? Actually, WinLink has that. WinLink has many different forms that you can do. Or, uh, they don't call them forms. They call them something else. But uh, the radiogram format is one of those. There's radiograms, but there's also a another format that you use in NTS as well. What are service messages? Okay, well, a service message is just a radiogram. It has all the same format. It can have the word SVC at the beginning of the preamble, but it doesn't have to. Uh, and it means uh, the, the text would be something like um, regarding your message number, not deliverable, phone not answered. That's a service message. It is a, a service message is a message that refers to a primary message that was already sent. Now, given what you've said earlier was is that it, the NTS system doesn't appear to be uniformly strong across the country, would you encourage amateurs to get involved in NTS and even form chapters in their areas in order to continue to pass this messaging? And do you think that in 2020 that NTS is still relevant other than a daily pastime, but do you think that it, in fact, is relevant for message handling in disaster situations? 
Well, I think it's 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 relevant in both ways. It's relevant uh, in training hams to accurately pass messages, which no matter what the format is that's used is important in disaster situations. Okay, so you may not you may be using an ICS two thirteen form, you know, or whatever the served agency gives you, but the techniques that you're going to be using will be similar to um, passing a message. Uh, an NTS message. Um, it's also a good way to get over my shyness for new hams. You know, if they don't know what to say, okay, I can't get on because I don't know what to say. And we'll tell you what to say. <laughs> Just read this. Uh, so I think it's relevant to that. It was proven relevant to disaster situations by the hurricane in Puerto Rico a few years ago, a couple of years ago. The messages were not in, in NTS form. They were just random name, phone number, and message. But the people who picked it up from the TAMs in Puerto Rico were traffic handlers in NTS, and they knew they were not bothered by the fact that it wasn't all there. They could put it back into the right format and make sure it got delivered. They can make it be delivered. It's sort of a haphazard training, and it's not used very often in disasters these days because our communication system in the mainland U.S. is pretty robust, except in just very local areas. When something big happens, amateur radio could be good for passing. And all the messages from Puerto Rico were like, to relatives in the U.S., I'm okay, or you know, the house is washed away, or, you know, something like that. Uh, health and welfare messages. Which is the chief purview of amateur radio in terms of message handling during disasters, right? All of the organizations that specifically, like ARIES, for example, that specifically support disaster services and work with agencies all the time, they're not going to be using amateur, or they're not going to be using uh, NTS for anything because they're pretty much local, localized, and they have their own forms. They want their own forms used. But the past uh, NTS is is a training form. You know, it's transferable. The techniques are transferable to other formats. Like last year in California, the Paradise Fire, where the entire town of Paradise burned to the ground. And people were displaced and moved all over the place. In fact, a number of people were killed there. Was the national traffic system active in sending health and welfare messages to relatives around the United States and around the world from the affected area? Well, there were really not much contact between the public and hams at that time. People got outside of the area where the, the power was off, and then they used their cell phone pretty much. You know, I can envision situations where, you know, like nowadays, unlike last year, they start turning off the power out here in California to prevent the equipment from starting starting fires when we have a high wind, uh, Santa Ana wind situation. So that's a new thing. We can have large parts of the area turned off at various times, even when there's not the fire hasn't started yet. Right. And I guess what they discovered, I've read this in the news, that there's a large number of cell sites that are not on backup power. Right. And cell sites only last for a day or two at most. Before they're gone, right. The problem is, uh, from our point of view, is con contacting, getting the connection between the people and the and the hams. Okay. And in, ha in the shelters, usually it's Red Cross has their own amateur radio people doing, covering those people. But... I tell people, you know, they go, well, how can you find, how can I find a ham to send a message? And I say, you know, well, you walk around before the event happens and find out where the large antennas are in people's yards uh, and make friends with those people, which is good for us in the long run. People realize that there's a reason why people have ham or big antennas. Now, you mentioned that NTS is probably a great area to kind of develop your CW operating skills. Is there some prerequisite, at least from a CW level, before one can actually start handling traffic for NTS? And do you recommend kind of a path of action in order to get to a level where you can pass messages on NTS as a new CW operator? NTS is, is in layers, okay? As I mentioned before, it's got the national layer, it's got the area layer, and the region layer, and then the section layer below that. And every section should have uh, ideally a section traffic manager and maybe a section net or a net that covers several sections. That's how I got into it personally. I got a message 
that wrote welcomed me to amateur no i think it was it was not a welcome to amateur radio it was welcome th- uh, welcome to the fists club because i joined that the guy was playing dumb you know he says well you know I'm not, he was trying to make conversation when he called me to deliver the message. And he's going, well, I'm not familiar with this. What is it? Right. And, you know, I said, oh, well, it's a CW club. And he said, oh, if you're interested in CW, you can join our traffic net. Well, I couldn't join the traffic net because it was on 80 meters and I had to, I didn't have an antenna yet for that. And I was pretty darn slow. Okay. But I did find one guy that was willing to take messages and from me to and fro on 40 meters, and then he took them to the net, okay? And so, and so you know, we tromped along at 10 words per minute uh, between the two of us, and he wasn't a section traffic manager, but he was a net manager for one of the local nets. His name is Dave Billich, KI6BHB, and I consider him one of my own. And a couple of other guys helped, you know, once I got on the nets uh, and the net myself and got my speed up a little bit, 15, I think, would be a reasonable speed for people to be on regular NTS traffic nets. Do those nets also, can they operate faster, or do they try to kind of maintain a level below 20 words a minute in order to make sure that everyone can send and receive those messages? Well, it depends on the level on the net. Uh, a local net, yes. Uh, a local net, we call the net uh, at 15 words per minute and ask for slow stations to check in first. New stations and slow stations. If we don't get anybody, we speed up to 18 or 17 or 18. Area nets are supposed to be, the region nets and area nets are supposed to be 20 words per minute. And they sometimes end up going faster depending on who's sending. It's my understanding that you're also involved in ARES in the Los Angeles area. I think that Amateur Radio Club in Pasadena has its chapter of ARES. Aries is, they have their meetings at a hospital in Pasadena. They're not associated with Pasadena Radio Club. Uh, And I go to their meetings uh, to represent NTS. And I do check in to their drill nets, their exercise nets, to let them know that I'm I'm there to take messages if there are any. And I've never gotten one, but that's one one way that there might be a contact with the outside. Let me take a quick break here to tell you about my favorite amateur radio audio podcast, the Ham Radio Workbench Podcast with George, KG6VU, and Jeremy, KF7IJZ, where they pursue topics, technology, and projects on their Ham Radio Workbenches every two weeks. George and Jeremy document their projects and make circuit boards available for sale to their listeners. They have interesting guests and go in deep. Even if you're a seasoned Ham Radio builder or just getting started, be sure to join George and Jeremy for the Ham Radio Workbench podcast. Use the link on this week's show notes page by clicking on the image. And now back to our QSO today. How active has ARES been or amateur radio operators been in the recent wildfires that seem to be plaguing Southern California and even Northern California right now? I think as we're speaking, there's still fires burning there in Southern California. The individual dis- jurisdictions, uh, and police departments and fire departments and so forth, generally have their own cadre of amateur radio operators, okay, and that operate under uh, what they call DCS, which is Disaster Services, Disaster Radio Communications, or Disaster Communications Service. It's more or less equivalent to um, RACES, but it's not as regulated as RACES. So those people are involved with helping with response and you know they might end up they might end up coordinating delivery of sandwiches to the firefighters you know something like that but they're coordinating it on the radio so and they have a net going on one of the we have a, a, a net a net system here called disaster amateur radio network that would be where most of it would be it's my understanding that you're also active on the papa system that name doesn't come up very often but what is the PAPA system, and what do you do there? Well, I have to say, I don't know what PAPA stands for. <laughs> I'm embarrassed. It's a, a mainly a social network of repeaters. And when I, especially when I got started, I was involved with that. And I would go to various nets and talk to people on, talk to, you know, let's go to PAPA, you know, and I would, if there was no one there, I would talk to individuals. 
You kind of miss the era of when in Southern California when every single repeater was busy all day long and all night, and now you have to go to these wide area systems in order to be able to find people to talk to. No, that's not the reason. The reason is the topography. I mean, we go from sea level to 10,000 feet in the San Gabriel Mountains within 30 miles. Right. There's a lot of repeaters that I can't get to if it's not part of the system. I can't. You know, I'm limited to who I'd be able to talk to. That's why the systems are in. From Pasadena? Yeah. I can't get into San Fernando Valley. Because you're pushed up right against the hills there under Mount Wilson? Right. I guess that's true. Although you could hit Oat Mountain from your house, I would think. I could hit Oat Mountain, yeah. And Saddle Peak? It's a Saddle Peak, which is really south of San Fernando Valley, but many people in San Fernando Valley can get Saddle Peak. What is QNI? Okay, well, QNI, CW has all these Q signs, okay, uh, three letters, abbreviations that are a whole sentence compressed into three letters. And the National Traffic System has their own set. Those are the QN ones, the Q, uh, because they're net, uh, net-oriented net sentences, okay? And QNI means we're open for check-ins. So QNI is an indication to check in to a traffic net. So that became the title of a newsletter, which is maybe from two to five times per year published when we have enough material. Jim Wade's back east is the main conspirator between that with that. And I proofread and contribute to that newsletter. And it's actually interesting reading, and I'll put a link to it in the show notes page so that any of the listeners want to check out the Q&I newsletter. It's actually quite interesting. Now that you've been to ham for almost a decade, what do you think is the biggest challenge to amateur radio now? Well, I, I notice that we have a huge number of new hams who are getting their tech license and maybe not doing anything. If you look on QRZ dot com and you look at your random call sign uh, and it says how many lookups can be three or it could be 10,000 okay and so those are the active hands and then there's the people who well just in case there's an event uh, a disaster of some kind I better have this bell phone radio and my wife can have one too and we can talk okay with uh, and they don't follow it up any more than that Okay, so I, you know, I, I think one of our big challenges is, is new hams who want to have a call sign and to be legal and a handheld radio to talk to their family, but they're not interested in going further. So they're missing out on like all the fun, in my view. Well, do you have a prescription for that? Is there something that ham clubs and individual hams could do in order to bring those people into the tent and get them active? Yeah, well, some ham clubs are more active than others, as you know. But, yeah, I think that ham clubs could, I mean, they could do the same thing I do, and that's uh, troll the FCC database and find out who in in their town uh, just got a license and, you know, maybe either send them a radiogram or send them a, a nice hard copy and invitation to come to the meeting, let them know where they are. Some clubs do that, some clubs don't. Do clubs, understanding that their demographics is getting older, do they actually have perhaps people that meet new people at the door in order to make sure that they don't feel they've walked into a strange land? Some clubs do and some clubs don't. I think, you know, some clubs are just old boys networks, you know, the old ones that don't do any outreach. Maybe they practice on field day. Maybe they will put up a station on field day, but they don't do much other than that. I'm not, I don't have any particular one in mind, but I know there are some like that. Pasadena Radio Club does have a, a greeting table when people come to the meeting. And, they, and when they do introductions around and before the meeting starts, they often get a cheer for a new, a new ham. But I don't think we get very many. I, don't, I think there's a lot more new hams out there that we don't, don't come to the Pasadena Radio Club meeting. It's my understanding that you're a YL as well, right? Are you a member of the YL ham radio group? I have been, but I'm not active. Do you think that women in ham radio meetings and ham radio groups are treated differently than men in groups? I haven't really noticed that, no. Okay. I think more of a challenge is the aging issue. The active hams 
being within Aries, I see a lot of people who are not old. So I know it's not 100% true, but there's a lot of hams that, that, are, that are aging out and really can't, you know, they're living in areas without uh, antenna or with antenna restrictions or uh, they can't operate for one reason or another. And uh, this is what's happening. One thing that's happening to NTS is many of the NTS operators and RRI operators are um, getting older and they can't do their own antenna work. Replacing those people is, is an issue. We're not going to have a problem replacing digital operators because the younger people are drawn to them. The face of ham radio might change. And now this message from QRP Labs. QRP Labs has shipped thousands of QCX QRP transceivers kits to date. The odds of working another QCX user gets better every day. If you're looking for a satisfying kit experience where you end up with an amazing performing QRP transceiver for under $50, let me say that again, for under $50, then you owe it to yourself to go to QRP Labs. We have many home brewers who listen to the QSO Today podcast. For you, QRP Labs also has parts, filters, enclosures, and other handy devices to make your home brewing experience even better. You can use these parts to either enhance your QRP Labs kits or to beef up your own homebrew designs. Be sure to browse Han's entire website. Use the link on this week's show notes page or the one in the sponsored section of the QSO Today website to get to QRP Labs to buy your QCX or any of the other fine QRP Labs kits or parts. QRP Labs is my go-to ham radio kit company. It should be yours, too. QRP Labs. And now back to our QSO Today. It may be one of the things that you point out is that perhaps there need to be Elmers in amateur radio clubs that specialize in working with older hams to help adapt the situations as their situation changes so that they can continue to be on the air, whether that's a remote station or whether it's an inside antenna arrangement, but something that matches the living situation that changes. I think that ham radio is still an amazing opportunity for people who are retired. Oh, I think that's true. As a destination every day and as a social outlet. Absolutely. And yeah, I think that there could be a space for people like that. What excites you the most about what's happening in amateur radio now? I'm interested in seeing where traffic handling would go because the people are dwindling and because ARL's not too interested at the moment. I'm sort of like waiting to see what's going to happen with that. I have another obsession also, and that is uh, CW Academy, which is part of the CW Operators Club. And that that's exciting because we have so many. One of the things that I'm doing there is helping register people, new students. I have been doing that for a year, and I've signed up 1,600 people. Before you go on, why don't you explain what CW Academy and CW Ops is in case the listeners missed some of the earlier episodes of QSO Today where we actually talked about this. But what is CW Academy and CW Ops? Okay, well, CW Operators came first, and it's a, a club of somewhat elite operators. In other words, you have to get on in QSO with three different people in the club at 25 words per minute in order to be admitted to the club. And they have their own contests, and you know it's it, it runs along on that on that basis. Ten years old, they're going to be celebrating their tenth year in January all month long. So you'll be hearing a lot of these fast code operators on the air. But they also run a subgroup of the CW Ops is CW Academy, which is designed to teach new pe- new hams or anybody interested you know, in learning or relearning CW. Um, we do it a little different than most of the old methods, okay? We don't start people at five words per minute. We start them at 20 words per minute with extreme Farnsworth, a lot of space between the characters. The letters are being delivered at 20 words a minute, but they're spaced at five words a minute spacing. Right. So people have somewhat amount of time to think about it. And we also teach them how to string letters in their head. So we hope that at the end of a couple of different classes that they will be copying in their head at 20 words per minute. Okay, and then the level three class brings them up to 25. And I got into it because I was going to these traffic nets uh, and I had to write down everything, including what net controls instructions were. So I went, I went to CW Academy hoping that they would teach me how to copy in my head, which they pretty much did. 
So that it was a success on that. Well, they must be successful. You're a big advocate. About half the students survived the first class. Most of the problems are time commitment because we make them practice 45 minutes a day in different sections, like three 15-minute sections of Purdue, uh, because that's what you need to have instant character recognition. How are those practice sessions done? Are those done individually? They just listen to audio coming from tapes or from MP3 files, or are they actually connected somehow with other hams and doing these practices? Well, the classes are uh, eight weeks long, and they meet twice a week on Skype or Zoom. Usually we use Zoom because it's better quality sound. Twice a week, uh, and then they have homework assignments in between that. And the curriculum is online. They don't really have to take the class, but the motivation of showing up for class and not dragging behind everyone else is important. You know, I think that's important. The camaraderie of the class is important. Now, you've recruited 1,600 people to CW Academy. How many of those are still involved? It's not 1,600. It's 1,600 classes signed up for it. So the same person could sign up for three different classes in the space of a year. But most, uh, I would say about half of them, uh, don't make it through the first class, only because they don't. They realize it's too much work. Do you see on the air that because of CW Academy and other, I know that there's a group on the East Coast that's also doing it, do you see more activity in the CW bands now as a result of these classes and these new CW operators? You know, it's really hard for me to know who's a student unless they happen to be a student of mine. A lot of the people who sign up for CW Academy are interested in summits on the air. And I don't go, I'm not in that crowd. So uh, I don't cross paths with those people. But they don't, certainly they know more CW than they did when they signed up for the class, if they get through the first class. CW is the original ham radio digital mode. So I think it's amazing. Oh, right now, it's very valuable because the propagation conditions are so terrible without without any any sunspots at all. And CW is, does better. It really does better than getting through to uh, a particular place. Than, than single sideband. Sideband, right. Do you chase DX? What bands are you operating on? This is a, a downside of being as active as I am in what I'm involved in. I don't have a lot of time to do contesting and DX on my own. I'm limited by a small housing lot, okay? And I have a G5 RV. That's the best antenna I've got. I can't run more than 100 watts without setting off CO alarms all around. So uh, DX is hard. But in terms of, you know, the western half of the U.S., I can do pretty well. I prefer rag tuning, actually, to structured contests. And are you rag chewing on CW? Yeah. I had that thing the most interesting rag chew I ever had was um, after the last CW net, uh, net at the end of the day, or at the end of the night, I got a call from some guy in Wyoming, Idaho or Wyoming or something like that. He was a doctor on an Indian reservation. I guess his social communication with the outside world was through ham radio. So I talked to him for about 10 minutes in CW before the band died. And then I went and looked him up on QRZ, and sure enough, his address was three miles or four miles south of Muddy Creek Road or on Muddy Creek Road. You know, you meet some interesting people, right? How important do you think it is for retirees to take up the amateur radio hobby? Well, actually, uh, since I welcome new hams and I look at the SCC debate database, most of them are, uh, well, a lot of them are, you know, looking at retirement and looking for something to do uh, after they after they retire. And it is a top, it ha, you know, whether it's electronics or, or digital programming or CW or whatever aspect of it is you get into, uses your brain and keeps your brain active a lot more than staring at a television set. So it could stave off dementia. Yeah. Do you have advice? that you'd give to newer returning hams now to the hobby? Get on the air. I th- you know, I think, I think that's the biggest thing, you know, new hams especially is, uh, you know, I really, I have my, uh, my, you know, handheld radio. I, I barely know how to use it. Uh, the battery's dead. And because I just want to talk to my wife after a disaster, you don't, don't depend on that. You have to be, the bands will be completely different then because there's going to be all these organized groups on the air uh, and you won't be able to just talk 
on any channel that you want to. You have to get acquainted with the procedures. You have to get acquainted with uh, the, the response organizations. Get involved. Don't just put the radio in a drawer. That's the most important thing. Right. And in fact, with some of these radios, even though they're so cheap, you have to have a PhD to figure out how to... Right. And, and don't be afraid to ask for help. I mean, if you uh, go to your local, your nearest ham radio club, if there is one, uh, and get yourself assigned to somebody to ask questions. You know, if you don't like the term Elmer, then don't use it. But get somebody to help you with uh, answering questions and maybe even help you install antennas. That's great advice. Don't be shy. Don't be shy. I think that works in a whole lot of different areas. Kate, I want to thank you so much for joining me on the QSO Today podcast. I really appreciate the perspective of someone who's joined amateur radio, maybe after retirement or in retirement. It's really gratifying to hear that you're so active on NTS and that NTS still exists. So perhaps maybe people hearing this podcast will say, you know what, I'm going to give NTS a try. Maybe you'll have some new NTSers after this podcast releases. So with that, I want to thank you so much and wish you 73. Well, thank you. And 73 to you too. And thank you for the invitation. Appreciate it. That concludes this episode of QSO Today. I hope that you enjoyed this QSO with Kate. Please be sure to check out the show notes that include links and information about the topics that we discussed. Go to www.qsotoday.com and put in K6HTN in the search box at the top of the page. My thanks to both ICOM America and QRP Labs for their support of the QSO Today podcast. Please show your support of these fine sponsors by clicking on their links in the show notes pages or when you make your purchases that you say that you heard it here on QSO Today. You may notice that some of the episodes are transcribed into written text. If you'd like to sponsor this or any of the other episodes into written text, please contact me. Support the QSO Today podcast by first joining the QSO Today email list by pressing the subscribe buttons on the show notes pages. I will not spam you or share your email address with anyone. Become a listener sponsor monthly or annually by clicking on the sponsor buttons on the show notes page. I am grateful for any way that you show appreciation and support. It makes a big difference. QSO Today is now available on iHeartRadio, Spotify, Libsyn, and TuneIn, as well as the iTunes Store. If you own an Amazon Echo, you can say, Alicia, play the QSO Today podcast from TuneIn. I still use Stitcher to listen to podcasts on my smartphone. The links to all of these services are on the show notes pages on the right side. Until next time, this is Eric Forz at 1UG73. The QSO Today podcast is a product of KEG Media Inc., who is solely responsible for its content.